has formulated itself in the figure of an ignorance laboring towards knowledge. We have seen that there is an essential reason either in the nature of being itself or in the original character and fundamental relations of its seven principles for this intrusion of ignorance, of discord into the harmony, of darkness into the light, of division and limitation into the self-conscious infinity of the divine creation. For we can conceive, and since we can, the divine can still more conceive, and since there is the conception, there must somewhere be the execution, the creation actual or intended. A universal harmony into which these contrary elements do not enter. The Vedic years were conscious of such a divine self-manifestation and looked on it as the greater world beyond this lesser, a freer and wider plane of consciousness and being, the truth creation of the creator, which they described as the seat or own home of the truth, as the vast truth, or the truth, the right, the vast. Or again, as a truth hidden by a truth, where the son of knowledge finishes his journey and unyokes his horses, where the thousand rays of, rays of consciousness stand together so that there is that one, the supreme form of the divine being. But this world in which we live, live seems to them to be a mingled wet in which truth is disfigured by an abundant falsehood, antratasya, bhurya, bhura. Here, the one light has to be born by its own vast force out of an initial darkness or sea of inconscience. Immortality and Godhead have to be built up out of an existence which is under the yoke of death, ignorance, weakness, suffering, and limitation. This self-building, they figured as the creation by man in himself of that other world or high-ordered harmony of infinite being, which already exists perfect and eternal in the divine infinite. The lower is for us the first condition of the higher. The darkness is the dense body of the light. The inconscient guards in itself all the concealed superconscient. The powers of the division and falsehood hold from us, but also for us and to be conquered from them, the riches and substance of the unity and the truth in their cave of subconscious. This was in their view expressed in the highly figured enigmatic language of the early mystics the sense and justification of man's actual existence and his conscious or unconscious Godward effort, his conception so bad, paradoxical at first sight in the world which seems its very opposite, his aspiration so impossible to a superficial view in a creature so ephemeral, weak, ignorant, limited, towards the plen plenitude of immortality, knowledge, power, bliss, a divine and imperishable existence. Yeah. A big para, <clears throat> quite a big para, and he is. So, remember what he is doing. We have started a new section altogether the knowledge and the ignorance. So, what is he trying to do? He is telling us that there is a spiritual experience where you see the physical world is unreal. So, we have to explain that. <clears throat> so, he has told you that there is really no unreality, everything is fine. It's only your way of looking that creates the unreality, and because there is a darkening of the consciousness. So now the question arises, why should there be a darkness of the consciousness? Because you are starting from the Advaita philosophy. There is only one supreme divine. There is nothing else. And Advaita, there is no second. Everything is only the divine. So in that case, how can knowledge become ignorant? How can Ananda become suffering? This is what we have to explain. So he is telling you in the first paragraph which we read yesterday. No, not yesterday. Um, yeah, no, not yesterday. So <clears throat> that there is a gradation and that gradation is infinite gradation. But for practical purposes, we will take it as seven planes of consciousness, which is the Vedic scheme. It's a Vedic arrangement. So we will go according to that stage. So what are the seven planes? Sat, Chit, Ananda, Supermind, 
or what you call in our vijnana okay or the true consciousness and there is the lower hemisphere which is in which we live the lower hemisphere also has got three levels there is a mind at the highest level there is a vital at the second level lower level and at the lowest level there is matter there is something even lower than that which is the inconscient subconscious and inconscient but we don't experience it so what we are experiencing is matter life and mind in the universal planes and in the individual planes corresponding to that matter corresponds to our body vital corresponds the prana the vast plane of prana shakti corresponds to our vital and the mental planes of consciousness okay that corresponds to our mind so this is what he is saying and now he is saying that at the highest level there is perfect purity and at the lowest level there seems to be the opposite so there is a divine divine who is manifesting himself into forms and there is an apparent because the funny part is that it is real and also unreal in a certain sense depending on how you are looking at it so there is a darkening of consciousness there is a lessening of ananda there is a complete disappearance of shakti at the lowest level and at the highest level all these things are there and there is a gradation this is basically what he is saying so we will go through each sentence because of the accuracy of the language but we will i'll do one thing i'll read out to you first the summary of what he is saying i have already given you the um, the substance of what he is saying and why he is doing it but still we will let me take a little time some thanks for my computer to respond to me It's not responding let me try <laughs> okay i will read it from something which is agam the summary okay whatever or however perfect be the satchidananda at the highest level here in the material world we see the opposites that's what he is saying in the para we see in matter an original in conscience from which consciousness slowly growing out of the darkness is climbing towards the supreme knowledge but as we have seen in all these seven planes there is no need of in conscience or ignorance we can conceive of a perfect manifestation or expression of satchidananda and if we can so can the divine more perfectly and completely conceive of a perfect world note interestingly that the animal can't conceive of a world of perfection and man perfect manifestation but we can man can so can the divine more perfectly and completely conceive of a perf perfect world and if he can conceive it must be a reality <laughs> that's another thing so he's going step by step we'll see that in the text itself whatever we can conceive of does and can exist that's whole point it is impossible to conceive of something which does not exist <laughs> and you can also say okay what about a flying tiger or what about a mermaid half woman half a fish but it is a combination of realities <laughs> so you can you can never never conceive of something that never exists okay <laughs> so it is this perfect heaven of bliss that the vedic rishis were conscious of and described as the home of truth sadana sadan sadan is also in our indian language also sadan is the uh, habitation the uh, home, house home ritasya is the home of ritasya truth swedame ritasya in which no disharmony could enter and the isha upanishad also says the same thing okay so okay my summary is not coming up very easily fully ah it has come up okay so i'll read it now whatever or i have read part of it but i'll read the whole thing now and then we go back to the text whatever or however perfect be the satchidananda here in the material world we see the opposites 
we see in matter an original inconscious total lack of consciousness from which consciousness slowly growing out of the darkness is climbing towards the supreme knowledge we have seen that life comes out and life is the opposite of uh, something dark and death okay is opposite then <laughs> we have seen mind coming out so there is an evolution but as we have seen in all these seven planes there is no need of inconscience or ignorance so we have to explain how it is possible to have ignorance when there is no possibility of god we can conceive of a perfect manifestation of satchidananda and if we can so can the divine more perfectly and completely conceive of a perfect world and whatever he conceives of becomes a reality it is this perfect heaven of bliss that the vedic rishis were conscious of and described as the home of truth sadana ritasya swedame one's own home the one's own home of truth in which no disharmony could enter and now but the vedic seers but to the vedic seers this lower manifested world appeared as a crooked and distorted one distorted one world anritasya bhure anritasya ritasya of truth anritasya of also bhure no full of extreme the vedic conception visualized that this home or truth had to be built by man within himself the in the there the, is always the individual and the universal and these truths are always applicable to both the worlds these perfect worlds in the universe already exist but man is plunged in the lowest and he has to build in himself all the possibility of all these perfect worlds so the vedic conception visualized that this home of truth had to be built by man within himself he had to climb from the lower imperfect world to the perfect higher plane of truth but to them the vedic seers the incompatibility of the two poles of existence so extreme that all harmony seemed impossible so this is what he has said so now we will go back to the beginning of the para and then we see sentence by sentence okay, so, so <clears throat> the seven planes of consciousness are there now but here in the physical world there is a world based upon an original inconscience original inconscience it seems to be always there permanently okay. <clears throat> it is true that it is permanently there but it's not a fundamental reality it's a secondary reality the inconscience is produced it is created by the uncreated satchidananda okay so this is what we have to understand so original inconscience original in the sense that it is eternal it cannot be negated it is there here consciousness has formulated itself in the figure of an ignorance laboring towards knowledge you can see that okay life mind and even yogis they have got an increasing amount of knowledge we have seen that there is no essential reason either in the nature of being that means sat in the nature of being in sat there is no absolutely no trace of any ignorance that's what he is saying okay we have seen that there is no essential reason either in the nature of being itself or in the original character and fundamental relations of its seven principles for this intrusion of ignorance so in the involution at the universal level there is no imperfection at all they are just diminutions so if the says in another place very interestingly he says that there is a diminution of sat diminution of chit diminution of ananda but there is no distortion there is no falsehood it's only a diminution <laughs> you can imagine what that means there is a lessening but there is no distortion distortion means falsehood comes in okay he is saying there is no reason for that okay. or in the original character and fundamental relations of its seven principles for this intrusion of ignorance so how does ignorance come in we have to explain 
of discord into the harmony, of darkness into the light, of division and limitation into the self-conscious infinity. So it does seem to be the opposite of the divine creation. For we can conceive and since we can, the divine can still more conceive and since there is a conception, there must be somewhere the execution, the creation, actual and intent or intended. Okay, so that's another thing. The creation of the perfect, it can be actual or it can be intended. It is not yet created. A universal harmony into which these contrary elements do not enter. There is a world where it does not happen. And that world is there even in the physical world, but hiding behind the forms. Okay. Behind the forms is a divine perfection. But you have to tune into it. If you are not tuning into it, you will see only the surface and you will see the imperfection and the darkness and the ignorance and the falsehood. A universal harmony into which these contrary elements do not enter. The Vedic seers were conscious of such a divine self-manifestation and looked on it as a greater world beyond this lesser and freer and wider plane of consciousness and being, the truth creation of the Creator, which they described as the seat or own home of the truth, as the vast truth or the truth, the right, the vast. They, um, they, Footnote says, Sadhanam Hritasya, the home of truth. Swedame, it's the own home of the truth. Swedame Hritasya. Hritasya Brihate. Ritam Satyam Brihat. Ritam, the right. Satyam, the truth. Brihat, the vast. This is the briefest possible explanation of the Superman. The Vijjana, plane of Vijjana. Okay, so then, or again, as a truth hidden by a truth, when the son of knowledge finishes his journey and unyokes his horses, where the thousand rays of consciousness stand together so that there is, so that there is that one, the supreme form of the divine being. This is actually, uh, he is quoting to the, he is uh, referring to the Isha Upanishad among the last, but unfortunately I have not been able to um, put the quotation, but I'll do that next time. After I finish this class, I'll bring it and put it in. But this world in which we live seemed to them to be a mingled weft in which truth is disfigured by an abundant falsehood. It seemed to them. This world in which we live seemed to them to be a mingled weft. Okay, the word weft is interesting. There is a woof and the weft. You see? The cloth is uh, horizontal and vertically. So when you are putting, uh, making a cloth on a womb, it's a weft and womb they call it. Okay, there is a shuttle, and the shuttle goes up and down like that, and the uh, the loom goes on up and down, and you get the cloth. So mingled weft. Mingled, that means truth and falsehood is mingled. In which truth is disfigured. That's why you have the dualities. Na? In the physical world, you have dualities. As you keep going up, the dualities disappear. Okay. But this world in which we live seems to them to be a mingled weft in which truth is disfigured by an abandoned falsehood. Andritasya bhure. Bhure, abandoned. Okay? There is a footnote there. And the footnote is giving to the Rig Veda. <coughs> Mandala 7, Anubhak 60, and the Mantra number 5. This is the Vedic. Uh, and the one below that, Apraketam Salilam. Apraketam without consciousness. Salilam, water. The infinite ocean of unconsciousness. That is the description in the Veda. But it refers to the inconscient. The infinite unconscious ocean of ignorance and darkness. Okay, so I go back to the text. Under the symbolic. Here, the one light has to be born by its own vast force out of an initial darkness 
or sea of inconscience. Immortality and Godhead have to be built up out of an existence which is under the yoke of death, ignorance, weakness, suffering, limitation. So these five words, one, two, three, four, five, are the opposites of the highest level. Death is replaced by immortality. Ignorance is replaced by knowledge, vidya. Weakness is released by infinite force. Suffering is re replaced by ananda. And limitation is replaced by the unlimited infinite. So this is the opposite. The word spirit and matter. They seem to be different. But essentially they are the same. This self-building they figured as a creation by man in himself of that other world or high ordered harmony of infinite being which already exists perfect and eternal in the divine infinite. At the highest level this perfection exists already. You have to climb up to it and man can do it in his consciousness. That's the Vedic conception. And it's a battle, it's a journey in the Vedic conception. The lower is for us the first condition of the higher. Okay. So, the lower, we are starting the journey from the lower, but we are capable of rising to the highest. That's what he's saying. So, we need, need not take the imperfections in the physical world as permanent. It can be changed. The darkness is a dense body of the light. Now, just see that sentence. The darkness is nothing but the dense body of the light. The subtle body of the light is at the higher level. The dense body at the lower level. <laughs> That's why we go on saying the subtlest is at the highest, the densest is at the lowest. Okay. It's true also of the physical atmosphere, the air. It is dense below and it is very, very rare above now. You have to wear a suit. When you go up 100 miles into space, you have to wear a suit because there's no air there. <laughs> you float. There's no gravitation either. <laughs> so this is exactly what we say. This self-building, they figured as a creation by man in himself of that other world or high-ordered harmony of infinite being which already exists perfect and eternal in the divine infinite. We read that already, so we'll go to the next one. Uh, darkness is the dense body of the light. The inconscient guards in itself all the concealed superconscient. Okay, so in the apparent darkness, the potential of the light is already there because it is light that has made itself dense and is hiding in the apparent darkness. That's what seeing this. Now the next sentence is very interesting. The powers of division and falsehood hold from us, but also for us. In other words, they seem to be not allowing us to get to the light, okay? the darkness. The darkness and division and falsehood are seem to be not allowing us to get to that light from us, away from us. But also for us, we have the capacity to get it. At present, we don't get it, but it is also there. Okay. And to be conquered from them, the riches and substance of the unity and the truth in the cave of subconscious. The cave of subconscious is the, <coughs> the lowest and there the potentiality, the instruments of climbing to the highest level are there potent, potentially. This was their view, the Vedic rishis, expressed in the highly figured in a enigmatic language of the early mystics. That's why the Vedas were so dense and their language is 5000 years old. So a language which is lost, how can we know exactly what they meant? But through the veil of language, Srivanda has been able to bring out something. There have been many attempts to understand the Vedas. The first in the secret of the Veda, he has explained that. The first attempt was by the Western philosophers, mainly the uh, Germans, okay? Max Muller, uh, Paul Deussen and others. And they understood nothing. They have interpreted completely like as though they are only um, 
pujas and rites okay and sacrificial uh, conventions that is absolutely not the truth okay they are all symbols okay so that was the first attempt second attempt was by yaska and uh, our famous uh, the one from <laughs> sayana okay and the third one was by uh, dan and saraswati so he also tried to but his spiritual experience in those days was incomplete therefore he could not do it fully and shrimdo has uh, with his deep spiritual knowledge he has been able to find out the uh, the secret of the vedas and its translation even then was not complete and that also out of the four vedas he has taken only the rigveda the other vedas he has not touched at all <coughs> he may have read them i don't know if he read them but he has not translated even the rigveda is not translated fully and all those translations are there in three books okay the hymns to the mystic fire where only translations are there the secret of the veda in which he has given a, uh, his uh, understanding of the vedas there are many essays there and there is a research that he did which is the vedic studies and that's the biggest book Vedic studies. So, enigmatic language of the early mystics. In fact, if you read uh, the shlokas, uh, you will feel that it is written by madmen. <laughs> the images are so so uh, involved that uh, you must suspect immediately that there is something symbolic. For instance, nobody uh, when you see something which is not natural. you must immediately suspect that there is something symbolic like for instance i just give you two examples one is <coughs> sita being born from the earth now what on earth when they uh, the ground is being uh, plowed sita comes up now with that possible <laughs> impossible so it's a symbol so and the symbol becomes very clear because then sita represents prakriti and prakriti is our body mind life from where our body come it has come from matter so that's the truth that is symbol so similarly like that we can understand all these symbols okay hanuman also no monkey is that powerful <laughs> so obviously there must be some symbolic meaning hanuman is a psychicized prana the vital okay that's why he can do all sorts of things he can jump across the sea he can lift up a whole hill that is the prana the shakti these are all symbols so the vedic symbols were so so apparently stupid that the uh, maxwell particularly thought that uh, it is idiotic undeveloped people have written and the very first expression of the truth which is absolutely not correct at all <laughs> because he could not get into the deeper meaning because he had no spiritual experience so i come back to the text now that was a little side issue of the vedas so this was the view expressed in a highly enigmatic figured enigmatic figures huh? symbolic figures are symbols enigmatic language of the early mystic the sense and justification of man's actual existence and his conscious or unconscious god word effort so that's why unconscious godward effort also is there in all men even the most stupid of men and the most ignorant of men also there is a element of progress in them you may not see it. that's why in the synthesis ram to says all life is yoga those are the last words of the first chapter <laughs> even when there doesn't seem to be any yoga at all there is it's a hidden yoga the journey starting from the bottom to the highest is there for everybody Our unconscious God would have put his conception so paradoxical at first sight in a world which seems its very opposite. His aspiration so impossible to a superficial view in a creature so ephemeral. He doesn't last. His body simply weak, uh, disappears. Weak, ignorance, limited. Now note the words. Ephemeral, weak, ignorant, limited. He has used the same words above. Okay, remember, death, darkness, weakness, suffering, and limitation. He is repeating the same thing. Towards a plenitude, plenitude, fullness, plenitude, fullness. In French, you have the word plan, plenitude, fullness of immortality, knowledge, power, bliss, a divine, 
and imperishable existence. So, the death becomes immortal, ignorance becomes knowledge, weakness and incapacity becomes Shakti power, suffering becomes bliss, and a divine and imperishable existence it becomes. So that's it, what he's saying in the We have got about and, 15 and, minutes. Yeah. So we can read one more. Rangada, Rangada. Yeah, tell me. Rangada, I want to ask something. Uh, so light, dark. Can you hear me, Rangada? Very clearly. Uh -huh. So light is not that, sorry, darkness is not the absence of light. It is just denser light. <laughs> it's another way of speaking. No? <laughs> you can say that when it becomes dense, the light is diminishing. <laughs> so it's only a question of words. The truth is the same. Okay. No? And another thing I wanted to ask you, Rangada. Yes. Related to this, but not in this. Ah. Uh, swar, Bhubar and Bhur. Swar, ah. Bhubar and Bhur. Yes, the yes. Three yes. words which come in uh, Veda or in Purana. That's right. Uh, does it correspond to the seven, uh, the lower three levels? Uh, yeah, as I said, this from the lowest bottom to the highest uh, top, it can be divided into many ways. So when you speak of who, who were, they are, uh, they are dividing into three. Because as I told you, they are not steps, they are ramp. No? Okay. It's a ramp, continuous ramp. So you can divide it any way you want. In fact, sometimes you can say spirit and matter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or you can even say that there is no division at all. Everything is the divine, depending on how you see. So who who was for uh, corresponds to the lowest level, the middle level, and the highest level. Who who was for. So it is a little flexible. And in our Indian philosophies, we speak of five levels. Ether, air, fire, water, earth. Okay. So you can divide into seven. So cylinder is taken as seven because it's more elaborate. But mother speaks of even twelve, and she says you can draw the line wherever you want because every inch that you go up, there's a change in the laws and the density of the substance and the light. It becomes more and more lighter, more and more lighter. So you can draw the line anywhere and discuss. So the Vedas are discussing with seven planes. The who who are swar, the Indian uh, three, are not going into complications. They are saying only three. There is the lower world, the higher world, and the highest. Uh, Rangada, this I am uh, reading. Uh, this has I have come across in one of the uh, essays of Sri Aurobindo. Where uh, I'll just read that portion. Mm. Just a small thing. Uh, the basis of the sevenfold world of the Puranas. And in brackets, they have uh, he has written Satyalok, Tapas, Jana, uh, ha, Jana, Mahar, Swar, Bhuvar, Bhur. So yeah. I just wanted to know: is does this correspond to the seven worlds which share with this talking about uh, you yes. know like matter, pran, mind, yes. Vijjana, yes. and then Satyat? Is it parallel to that, or is it different? Yes. That's all I want. Yes, that's right. It is because you can also think of the. Uh, bhu bhuvar swar is another way. You can also think of it bhu as matter, bhuvar as the vital world, and swar as the mental world. You can also that's what I wanted to ask. That, that you can say it that way because that's what is available to us. So that also is possible. But when you say mind, the mind is there everywhere. When you say prana, the prana is there everywhere in different grades. Na? There is a matter, even in matter, there is prana. There is the energy. You can now we have learned how to get that energy out of matter. Okay, that's a nuclear energy that we can get out. Okay. Just as well, there is fire in a matchstick. Okay, this is a very interesting image that uh, Swami Ranganathan. You know, he was a president of the Ramakrishna Mission. He was a very intelligent man, and when he had gone to Australia, he gave this example that there is fire in a matchstick. The divine is there in the human being, but you don't see the fire. You have to light it. So that way, if you see, then you can say bhu, bhuvarswar, body, life, and mind. 
but mind is there everywhere okay <laughs> and um, the vital vitality also is there everywhere so it's a way of seeing things we have to be a little more flexible in our mind if you make very clear um, divisions and geographical locations the physical is the lowest then the higher because body mind life is the lower hemisphere so you will get stuck <laughs> so you have to see that there is a flexibility and depends on how you are looking at it okay but for convenience sake in discussion in the real, in the immediate um, subject that we are discussing who hovers work can also be seen as the lowest world the middle worlds and the highest world or you can also think of them as matter life and mind in the lower hemisphere that also is possible okay <laughs> thank you rangada okay so uh, we have about 8 uh, minutes left so we can read the next paragraph for as a matter of fact so yasmin you will not be there tomorrow shall i read yes yes you can read okay go ahead for as a matter of fact for as the matter can you hear me yes but uh, uh, i think my yeah i think the connection is not good i i hope other people read can i read can i read i think so because you won't be there tomorrow read <laughs> for <laughs> as a matter of fact while the very keyword of the ideal creation is a plenary self consciousness and self possession in the infinite soul and a perfect oneness the key word of the creation of which we have present experience is the very opposite it is an original inconscience developing in life into a limited and divided self consciousness an original inert subjection to the drive of a blind self existent force developing in life into a struggle of the self conscious being to possess himself and all things and to establish in the kingdom of this unseen mechanic force the reign of an enlightened will and knowledge and because the blind mechanic force we know now really that it is no such thing confronts us everywhere initial omnipresent the fundamental law the great total energy and because the only enlightened will we know our own appears as a subsequent phenomena a result a partial subordinate circumscribed and an energy the struggle seems to us as the best a very precarious and doubtful venture the inconscient to our perception is the beginning and the end the self conscious soul seems hardly more than a temporary accident a fragile blossom upon this great dark and monstrous atmosphere free of the universe or if we suppose the soul to be eternal it appears at least as a foreign and alien and not over well treated guest in the reign of this vast inconscious if not an accident in the inconscient darkness it is perhaps a mystery a stumble downwards of the superconscient light yeah okay so this is what he is saying we have uh, four minutes only left but basically what we can do is why is why is he called the ashwatha tree of the universe mm -hmm. as monstrous means yes. it's not good No, I didn't follow what you said. Yeah, Ashwatha tree. What about it? Why has it described it as monstrous? Ah, because it's very large, na? The Ashwatha tree is one of the largest monsters, not in a negative sense, but in a very large way. It is so large. Gigantic. 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but shameless use the word monstrous because it can shock you. It is so big, like a monster. <laughs> in fact, the vastness can always shock the limited person. Na? You always get a shock when you see something vast. Even if you're standing on the sea beach and you are participating in the storm when a cyclone is there, it can be pretty awesome. <laughs> okay, that's why you use the word monstrous. <laughs> The but what is what is its exact significance? Okay, that's what I'm saying. It is the the world at the highest level is one, right? And at the lowest level, it is the many. The one becomes the many. So the Ashwatha tree is a symbol of the creation. At the highest level are the roots, and at the lowest level are the branches, the leaves the fruits and the flowers, the one becoming the many. Okay? That is the essence. So in Gita also it is there, in the Upanishads also it is there, the one becoming the many. And the roots are above. Esho Ashwatta Sanatana. Urdhva Mulo. Mula. Mula is the Urdhva, above. <laughs> and the leaves are below the branches. Okay, So that's the example. The, by the way, the Ashwatta tree is not... Uh, uh, is not the banyan tree, huh? The banyan tree is different. Actually, the banyan tree may be even more uh, more monstrous than the Ashwatha. But the banyan tree goes on throwing out its uh, branches and becomes a root. So that's quite a different phenomenon. Okay? You can also say that a banyan tree is a symbol. <laughs> that the branches go down and become the root. <laughs> It's, you will see many, many, many. If you've seen a uh, banyan tree, it's very interesting. It seems to be so many trees at one time. So it is symbolic of the connection between the highest and the lowest. But the Ashwatha tree is a very large tree. We used to have it in the opposite the playground, in that building which is called, uh, what is it called? Nantai. Nantai. We used to have an Ashwatha tree in the corner. But it fell down one day in a in a cyclone. So now we don't have that tree. It's a very large tree with big leaves. Pardon? Okay. So I'm reading out the summary and we'll do it in detail next time. Okay. Would it, would it by any chance represent the cosmic consciousness? Not the cosmic consciousness, but the cosmos itself. And in the cosmos, there is consciousness, there is power, there is ananda, everything is there. Okay. The consciousness is one aspect of it. <clears throat> the whole cosmos, the Ashwatha tree represents the whole cosmos. And it represents the Satchitananda coming down. Okay. We speak of consciousness, but consciousness is one aspect. There is also power in it, there is also ananda in it. But there is a gradation. At the highest level, all three are there fully. At the lowest level, they are there minimum or they seem to even disappear in matter. Okay. So, I'm reading out the summary of what he said, what he's saying in this paragraph. The supreme reality is the very opposite of the manifested world. The supreme reality is the very opposite of the manifested world. Seems to be. The divine is one, perfect, all power, knowledge and delight. The world is on the contrary, the many, the imperfect, the powerless, ignorant and full of suffering and pain. So it appears to the normal man and it leads to what is known as the philosophy of existentialism. A philosophy of despair and pessimism. There does not seem to be any solution for the miserable condition of the imperfect world. This is basically what he's saying. But there is a solution and that will be present in the next one. So, it's, uh, we have already gone one minute past the time. So, we stop here today and we'll... Tomorrow is uh, Thursday, also Life Divine. So, we'll take it up. So, okay. Tomorrow you will start the reading <laughs> because you couldn't read today. <laughs> Let your yes, yes. internet connection be perfect tomorrow. <laughs> so yes. we we'll read it for as a matter of fact. Okay. Yes, I will make a note. Yeah. Okay. 
Good morning everybody have a nice day Good morning thank you